Um, here is just Adam's just little bit of ast astrology uh, for you. Did you guys know there's an astrological event taking place tomorrow? Nod your head up and down. Did you guys know? About? This is a cool thing. Okay, this is like the star of Bethlehem. Okay, this happens like eight, every 800 years or so. Um, Jupiter and uh, Saturn, I believe, um, are aligning tomorrow. And most people believe that that is the event that took place all those years ago uh, whenever the wise men were looking for Jesus. It is that event, uh, except for whenever it happened then, there was actually a third planet, Mars, um, actually united with it as well. And so that is taking place tomorrow. They say it's about 45 minutes after it turns dark. Um, so that means about what, uh, 1.30? Um, and so um, <clears throat> I don't even know whenever it gets dark now, right? This is always dark. But um, so tomorrow, about 45 minutes after it gets dark, uh, you can look out to the sky and uh, you can gaze on the event that took place all those years ago. Pretty cool thing uh, to be able to do uh, tomorrow because it is Christmas. I mean, I, so we, we ready, you know, we, we got it all taken care of. How many of y'all still have Amazon packages you are waiting on me? Just a little bit. Right. How many of y'all got your presents all wrapped? You ready to go? Now, um, I, whenever I was growing up, the kind of the way that, that we did things in, in the Turner household was, you know, whenever mom and dad started doing the shopping, um, they would start the wrapping and then they would put the presents under the tree. And so there would be presents under the tree, you know, for a long time, you know, depending on how quickly mom started, started shopping, you know, so you could have presents under the tree from like the first of the December to uh, December 25th. Is that kind of how y'all, y'all roll? Um, now my, my wife's family, um, if I understand her correctly, they like hid all the presents and they didn't put them out under the tree until like Christmas day or Christmas Eve. Did any of y'all grow up like that? Okay, so we know who we're praying for right now. All right, because that's trauma right there. That's hard, you know, because I, I loved it, you know, because one of the great things about the, the tree, you know, having presents under it is whenever you're a kid is like you dive underneath the tree and it's like you start to look at the labels and try to figure out which one's yours. And uh, then you would, you would shake it and try to figure out what transformer, you know, that, that, that could be if I'm dating myself just a little bit or what He-Man toy that could be. Um, if you got really good, you learned how to, to, to peel the tape back and be able to look in and say, anybody else? Can, come on now, come on, confession now, we're in church. How many of y'all did that? Okay, all right, bunch of sinners in this room, right? You know, it's like, <laughs> learn how to, con, you know. Did anybody ever like completely unwrap something and play with it before? Oh, wow, wow, that's a special evil right there, all right. But um, so that, that's just that's one, of the, one of the fun parts about it. And um, so I, I remember one Christmas that my, my grandpa, my grandpa Turner, so my dad's dad, um, he got tired, I guess he got tired of us going underneath his tree and grabbing the presents and shaking them and trying to figure out what it was. And so he had a Christmas to where he was like, I am going to make it to where they can't do it. And so we get there, I was about 13 years old and we go over to grandma and grandpa's house and we'd see that there were these presents under the tree. And so we go under there to look at it and there were no names on the presents. There were only numbers on the presents. And we're like, Grandpa, what is going on? He's like, well, you're just going to have to wait until Christmas Eve to find out. And I'm like, but whose present is this? He's like, you're going to have to wait until Christmas Eve to find out. And so as you can kind of imagine, it just like built up a lot of anticipation in us. And we're like, we can't wait for Christmas Eve, you know, to go to the Christmas Eve service at First Baptist Church in Carthage, Missouri, and then to go over to Grandma and Grandpa Turner's house and open presents. And so we spent all this time, the weeks, just in anticipation. What number am I? Whose number is that? How come that number has more presents than everybody else, you know? And so we get there and it comes time for grandpa to start, you know, telling us whose presents are whose. And so he just starts going off by memory. He's like, okay, all the number ones, those go to G. Uh, number twos, those go to Cindy. Uh, number threes, those can go to Larry. You know, then he starts just going through all the grandkids. Adam, you're number eight. And he's going through all these things. And, and so we all end up with these piles of presents just right in front of us. No names, just, just numbers. And it's now it's time to open gifts. Now, the, the other thing that we did at the Turner family Christmas that we didn't do at our other ones, and maybe some of you, this is how you do things, um, is we opened one person at a time, one gift at a time, and youngest to oldest, and then it just kind of, anybody with me? You track them with me? I think that's how we're supposed to do it in the Bible, but, and so it, it's just kind of there, but it, but it, but it takes a long time, and, but one of the great parts about that is you actually get to see what everybody else is getting, and so it did not take long for us in the opening process to realize that something in grandpa's great plan had gone wrong. All right, because very quickly you have like eight-year-olds opening up presents that are obviously meant for 
75-year-old women, you know, and it's just like all these things are going on. And so it was a great idea, but Grandpa had two problems in his plan. Number one, whenever he started calling out numbers and telling everybody whose gifts they were, he was going by memory, and he left his list back in his bedroom. And so he messed up all the numbers uh, and just mixed them up all the time. Second thing is, he did the same thing whenever he was labeling presents, okay? And so he messed his own list up at the very beginning. And so it was the craziest Christmas ever because you spent the entire night opening up presents going, oh, this is great. Is this for me? You know, and it's, it's just kind of like a weird thing. But, you know, so, so Grandpa had this like great plan. It just didn't go according to plan. And as I think about it, that's kind of how Christmas can go sometimes, you know, to where we, we have these plans just kind of made up in our mind of way we want things to go. And then more often than not, it just doesn't happen the way that we wanted it to actually go. It didn't go according to plan. Like, you know, maybe you've been dropping the hints all year long about the one thing that you want, you know, the one thing you want from your husband or the one thing you want from your wife. And you've been dropping hints and dropping hints and dropping hints. I mean, you made an Amazon wish list that had one item on it, you know, and it's like, I'm going to leave the browser open all the time to it. And, and you get to Christmas day and you open up the gift and you're like, oh, a Donald Trump Chia Pet, that's, uh, that's not what was on the list, you know, or maybe it was, I don't know, but, you know, or you worked and worked and worked to find the perfect gift, and you give that perfect gift to the perfect person, and their response is, thanks, and you're like, that's not what I was looking for, I wanted tears and good ones, you know, is what I wanted, it's so easy to just kind of build things up at this time of year, and to kind of go, this is the way I want things to go, but so often, Things don't go the way we want them to go this time of year. And a lot of times, it, sometimes it does have to do with the gifts, but can we be honest? A lot of times it's in the more important areas of life. You know, like sometimes it's, it, it's the fact that like this Christmas, maybe some of y'all online right now are struggling because this is the first Christmas after the divorce. And so right after the divorce, this is the first one to where you're trying to figure out who's going to get the kids, where they're going to go. Are you going to have the kids on Christmas Eve or are they going to? Or, you know, how's it all going to work? And you're trying to figure all that nonsense out. And you're like, this is not how I envisioned Christmas. You know, or, or, or maybe this is the, the first Christmas to where they're not going to be there. Because, you know, there's going to be an empty chair this Christmas. You know, this is the first Christmas without Grandpa. This is the first Christmas without Grandma. And you're just kind of like, this isn't how I was really wanting it to go. I, I mean, come on now. I mean, it's 2020. None of us thought Christmas was going to look like this. I mean, how many of us thought at the beginning of 2020 that we were going to be making plans to like FaceTime with grandma and grandpa for Christmas? Like, I didn't want that. That's not how I wanted things to go. This isn't how I planned things to be. And so it is so easy in like the, you know, the, the, the way that we can just kind of build up this season kind of romantically, you know, just so we get all these grand illusions. It is so easy for those hopes to be dashed because our plans and our expectations weren't met. And here's the thing I know about me. Maybe you know this about you, but whenever I have expectations that aren't met, I generally don't handle it very well. And a lot of times my hopes just go down the toilet whenever my expectations have not been met. Because it's like, this isn't the way I wanted it to go. I wanted it to happen like this. And so it's so easy in the midst of that, can we put it this way, to lose hope whenever our expectations aren't met, whenever our plans don't come to fruition. And that's 2020. And so here we are, it's Christmas time, 2020, and we're talking about, as a church, we're just like, hey, we understand this has been a difficult year. We understand nobody planned this year to look this way. But in the midst of this, it is still Christmas, and we still can hope during this time of year. We can hope again because the hope of the world arrived in Jesus Christ himself. And so we have a great hope still, even though our plans haven't gone the way that we wanted them to go. And today, as, as we move into week three of this, I want to talk about just specifically, how do we have hope when the plans fail? And to help you see that, um, I, want to show, I want to take you to a story that if you're new to church, you probably are familiar with. If you've been in church for a while, um, you, you, you know this story. You've read this story. You've heard this story. Um, you may have even done coloring sheets on this story kind of thing, all right? Um, but it's the story of, of Mary. Because if there's anybody whose plans did not go according to their plan, can we just agree that Mary and Joseph probably get the blue ribbon, all right? Because nothing that they had planned out went according to their plan, but yet 
God's purpose still prevailed. It's in the, it's in the Gospel of Luke, Luke chapter 1. If you got a Bible, we're going to look at uh, several verses here. We're going to start off in verse 26. This is what Luke tells us. He says, in the sixth month of Elizabeth's pregnancy, that is uh, Mary's aunt, okay? Um, In the sixth month of Elizabeth's pregnancy, God sent the angel Gabriel to Nazareth, a town in Galilee, to a virgin pledged to be married to a man named Joseph, a descendant of David. The virgin's name was Mary. And the angel went to her and said, greetings, you who are, and everybody say this part with me, you who are highly favored. You're highly favored. The Lord is with you. Mary was greatly troubled at his words and wondered what kind of greeting this might be. But the angel said to her, don't be afraid, Mary, because you have found favor with God. You will conceive and give birth to a son, and you are to call him Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High, and the Lord God will give him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over Jacob's descendants forever, and his kingdom will never end. So we've got Mary here. She's about 13 to 15 years old, so she's a teenage girl. So that means she spends her day on Snapchat, taking selfies, doing things of that nature. And and so she's there, 13, 15 years old. Um, She is also um, betrothed is the the old school word, word, um, you know, pledged to be married, which means she's not married, but she's also more than engaged, all right? So it's not like I can just take the ring off and give it back to you and say, this is over. This is a, if we're gonna end this relationship, we gotta get lawyers involved kind of stuff. Um, But but yet they still have not consummated the marriage. They haven't had their honeymoon night yet. And so it's not quite married, but it's more than engaged. And so here she is just there minding her own business. And the Lord sends an angel, the angel Gabriel to her. And he's like, greetings, you who are highly favored. And she's automatically troubled. Isn't that interesting? You know, he's like, you're favored. And what is Mary's internal response? Troubled. Now, why? Well, here's why. I mean, as the story unfolds, we kind of get a better idea of of why she's troubled. But here's the deal. She may have found favor with God, but soon she will find unfavor with people. Because this message that Gabriel is about to drop on her, that she is going to conceive, she's going to have a child, even though she is a virgin, even though she's not married, okay? Um, This is one of those things to where this could really wreck her life. Really, really could. Now, if you've been in church before, you might know some of this stuff. But like, you know, um, one, one of the things like if, if you were, if you were a, a, a woman and you ended up pregnant outside of, of marriage, you know, nowadays we just give them TV shows. Um, but, um, sorry. Uh, and so, um, but um, where was, oh yeah, there we are. And so back, back then, back then, one of the things that they could do is they could like, I mean, like the law said they could be stoned. Like they could actually, you know, stone them to death. Um, you know, very least she's probably going to lose the relationship to Joseph because he's going to assume that, you know, she's been running around on him. Um, very least she's going to deal with whispers and rumors for the, like a long time, you know? Um, but here's something I, I learned this week. I didn't know one of the other things that they could do to people who, um, you know, got pregnant out of uh, wedlock is that they could actually take her, strip her down and uh, just take her outside the city gates and just throw her out there and just leave her so that people would just mock her and just show her all the disdain that you can, you can imagine there. So whenever an angel shows up and he's like, you who are highly favored, she is greatly troubled. You know, because it feels like favor should be there, but she says this feels more like trouble than favor right now. But he's like, no, 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 listen, you, you are highly favored because God's got a plan for you. And he's like, Mary, you know, you're, you're a good young Jewish girl. You, I know you, I know you've been waiting your entire life for, for God to to send his savior, to send his Messiah into the world. And the reason you are so favored, young Mary, is because you are going to be his chosen instrument for that that child to be delivered into the world, for the Messiah to enter into the world. It's going to be your baby, Mary, who is going to be the one who is going to reign on the throne, who's going to make things all right. Your baby, Mary is the one who's going to set all things to right. Greetings, you who are highly favored. I've got great news for you. And one of the things I love about Mary is she, she seems to move pretty quickly from trouble to, to some faith, but there's just one thing that's just kind of like stuck in her, her mind. She's like, all sounds great and everything, you know, but verse 34, she says, so how's this going to be since I'm a virgin? 
you know, we would say it like this, you know, how's this going to be? Because I've been to, I had the special class where they pulled the girls out of class and the boys out of class and they gave us the talk. So I've had, I know, and, and I know how things work. I don't understand. How's this going to be? Because I'm a virgin. This doesn't make any sense to me. You know, it's kind of like this. Um, stick with me for just a second. But um, I was thinking about a way to try to explain just how ludicrous this is. So um, I hate golf. I hate it. I hate it. I hate it. I haven't played golf in 15 years. The last time I played golf, I almost quit being a Christian. Okay? And so it's like, I, I just shouldn't do this anymore, all right? Because I wanted to yell. I wanted to scream. I wanted to cuss. I wanted to beat things. And it's like, this is not good for my faith. So I should probably just never touch a golf club again. And so I haven't. I haven't touched a golf club in 15 15 years. So, so imagine this, that come, you know, about April, let's assume it's going to happen in April, I get a call from the people at Augusta, and they're like, hey, we're doing a new thing to where we're inviting, you know, preachers around, you know, the state of Georgia to come play in the Masters tournament, and we would love for you to come play. And I'm just like, you know what, I haven't played golf in 15 years, but you know what, this sounds like a pretty good opportunity. I'll go up to that little course, and I'll go up there and I'll play. And so I go up there, not touching a club for 15 years, and I go out there, and I tell you all, you know, on Thursday it goes up, and I'm hitting just straight down the middle, straight down the middle, straight down the middle. You know, and the next day, straight down the middle, straight down the middle, straight down the middle. I'm hitting all my putts. Everything is going great. And by the time Sunday comes along, at the end of the tournament, they put the green jacket on me because I won, right? Now, you're sitting there like, that sounds insane, right? Sounds crazy, but here's the deal. I have a better chance at winning the masters than a virgin does of getting pregnant. Okay. That's just what it is. Okay. Just think about that for just a second. There's a better chance of me doing that than a virgin ever getting pregnant. And so that's why she's like, I don't know. I don't know how this, this sounds impossible to me. And that's whenever Gabriel says these words, this is how the old translations put it. And I love it. He's like, nothing is impossible with God. Nothing's impossible with him. He's like, I know it sounds crazy, Mary but nothing is impossible with our God. And then Mary says those just incredible words. Whenever she looks at the angel, she says, okay, let it be. Let it be done to me as you have said. It is going to be. And this little 13, 14, 15 year old girl moves from a place of being greatly troubled, overwhelmed with fear and realizing that the favor of God is truly going to rest upon her and that she is the Lord's chosen instrument to usher in the very savior of the world. It's an amazing story, you know, it really, really is. Mary, it just it blows my mind, just the amount of faith that this young little girl has. And the way that she is able to find hope even when things didn't go as she planned. Because let me just call you back to the beginning. This is not how she planned things to go. She wasn't in you know, grade school drawing a picture and they're like, what, what do you want your life to be? I want an angel to show up to me and tell me I'm going to give birth to the son of God even though I'm a virgin. That's how I'm planning things to go. This was not in her life plan. But yet she continued to hope because she trusted in her God. And so today, maybe we find ourselves to where we're saying things aren't the way that we planned them to be. How do we find hope? How do we maintain hope? And let me give you just two quick thoughts today as we wrap up. One of the, one of the ways that we can maintain hope whenever things aren't going the way that we plan is we, we remember this, that what we call interruptions, God calls invitations. We call it an interruption. It feels like God interrupts Mary's life, right? He just like shows up and he's like, boom, here we are. You're going to have a child. This isn't the way you planned it. And so I'm interrupting all of your plans. But it's also, but I am inviting you to be a part of my story. I am inviting you to be a part of the redemption of all mankind. It feels like an interruption right now, Mary, but I promise you this is actually an invitation to join me and to join my story. And this is what God does all the time. He interrupts people, but those interruptions are actually invitations. I think about Moses, you know. Uh, Moses is out there just minding his own business, just taking care of his father-in-law's sheep, and he's just doing his own shepherd job. And then he, he looks off to the side, and he sees that there's a bush that's on fire, and he's like, well, I better go check, out, check that out. And so he walks over to the burning bush, and then all of a sudden the bush starts talking to him, take your shoes off, and now you're going to go to Pharaoh and tell him to let my people go? Well, that's a bit of an interruption, right? But it wasn't an interruption. It was actually an invitation 
Moses, you, you are my man. I, I want you to be the guy. I think about, you know, Peter and James and John, and they're out there on a boat, and they're, they're casting their nets, and they're casting their nets, and they're casting it, nothing, nothing, nothing. And then this guy walks up to him and says, have you tried the other side of the boat? No, we haven't tried the, okay, whatever. And so, and so they try the other side of the boat, and they end up, they pull out all those fish, but then that guy looks at them and says, hey, come follow me. Seemed like he was interrupting them, but he was really doing an invitation, wasn't he? So often what we think are interruptions are actually God's invitations in our own life. And some of y'all, this is what you have experienced. You know, because you have somebody at work or in your family or in your life at the ball field or whatever, and they just interrupted you and interrupted you and interrupted you. Hey, you need to come to church with me. You need to come to church with me. You should come to church. My church is great. And you got so sick and tired of hearing about their church and then interrupting you and your life that you finally just said, fine, if it'll make you shut up, I will go to church with you. Okay. And so you did. And then you showed up here and then something was said from this stage. A song was sung, or there was an interaction that took place in that lobby, and you went, okay. That wasn't an interruption. That was an invitation. God was trying to do something in my life, and now you can see it. It looked like an interruption at the beginning, but it wasn't. It was actually an invitation into a relationship with God. Or, or maybe, you know, you had a friend that was sick and you just kept hearing about it and hearing about it. And you're like, man, I should go see, but I don't have time. You know, should, this is pre-COVID days, you know, and I should go see them. I should go do this. And I should, but I don't have time. I don't have time. But there's just like this nagging feeling in your life. It was just like, I really need to go do this. And so you went and you went and visited them and, and you started talking to them. And then you started offering comfort to them. And then you heard yourself saying, can I pray for you? And you're like, what is going on here? What is going on? And then, and then you walk out of that and you go, oh my goodness. What did the Lord just do? I was able to give comfort to someone. I was able to pray for someone. I was able to step out of my comfort zone and do something. And I think they were actually comforted by that. And then the weirdest thing is, is I think I was comforted by it all at the same time. You thought it was an interruption, but it was an invitation to step into what God had for you in that moment and for your life. Or, or you know what, maybe you, you've heard us say, you know, we need help, you could use, we, you know, where are you serving? How are you helping out? Put me in, coach. How can you make a difference? How can you be a change maker in this world? And you're like, fine, fine, fine. I'll volunteer with the little kids every fifth Sunday of every other month, you know, and I'll, I'll do that. And so you, you finally just, you give in and you do it. And then finally that Sunday comes in and you go and you read a Bible story to a four-year-old and you see their eyes light up and you see the way that they respond to you and your heart just melts and you go, I didn't think I had time for this. This felt like an interruption to my schedule and my plan. And this was actually God inviting me into something right here. So, so often what we think is an interruption is actually a divine invitation. And that's what Mary is experiencing. It feels like an interruption to her life, but it is actually a divine invitation to step into the story that he has for her. The second thought I'll leave you with is this, is that God's calling is greater than our plans. His calling is greater than, we'll personalize it, your plans. His calling is greater than my plans. Once again, this isn't how Mary and Joseph plan things. But yet they, they learned pretty quickly that the call of God is greater than any plans that we could help, that we could, we could hold. And it's always better to step into his plan than to hold on to my plan and miss the call. And so they stepped into the call of God. And some of you all, you've experienced this. Because you, what you thought was your plan was the right way to do things, you actually discovered that, no, God's call is better than my plans all the time. Because there was a job that you interviewed for. And you knew that you were the best candidate for the job. You knew that you were the right guy for the job or the right gal for the job. You knew the people that you were interviewing up against and you knew how bad they were at their job, you know? And you're like, this is it, this is it, this is it, this is it. This is the thing that the Lord has for me. And then you get the note or you get the call or you get the letter and it's like, sorry, we're going in another direction. And you're like, what in the world, God? Can you not see God who sees all things, how good I would have been at this job? And then, because you had a no there, you decided, and it's like, well, maybe this business that I've wanted to start for all those years, maybe it's time to step out into that. 
Or maybe, you know, there was another job opportunity that just like fell into your lap. Or maybe the job that you were at, you know, already currently, you're currently at, they come to you and they say, hey, uh, we want to give you an expanded role. We want to do this and we want to we want to help you take next steps. And you're like, oh, okay. So maybe my plan isn't the best plan all the time. Or maybe you were dating, you know, Mr. or Mrs. Wright, and you're just like, you've got all the plans, you've got the Pinterest board, you've got it all where it needs to be, you've got your grandkids named, you've got everything out where it needs to be. You have made your plans. And then all of a sudden, for whatever reason, that relationship goes, and you're like, oh gosh, now I'm going to be lonely for the rest of my life. There's no, I'm never going to ha be happy again. There's no way that this could work out for good. But then all of a sudden, Mr. or Mrs. Absolutely Right. They walk into your life and you're like, oh, I'm so glad now. His calling is always better than our plans. His ways are higher than our ways. His thoughts are higher than our thoughts. His plan is better than our plan. And so he, he's calling us today to step into that call. And to say, not my purpose, not my plan, God, but I want to be about your plan. I want to be about what you are about. And so maybe right now what is going on in your life, maybe there is something that God is calling you to do that you have been resisting because it doesn't fit into your plan for your life. Maybe God has been calling you to reach out to a friend and say, you know what, I, I need to include them or I, I, need to, I need to invite them or I need to share my story with them about what the Lord has been doing in my life. But it, I don't know that I really want to do that. And it's like, but this is what God is calling you to do. You know, maybe God is calling some of you. Maybe you're in a bad dating relationship and you're like, I, I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. I don't know if now's the right time. Listen, if you ain't married, it's always the right time to end the relationship. Okay. That, that's kind of what it, you ain't married yet. Okay. So end it. Okay. And so it's just like, I don't know, but maybe that's what the Lord is calling you to do. It's just like to say, you know what? I, I don't, I think I need to be single right now. You know, maybe right now, maybe this is somebody watching online. Maybe God is calling you to start praying in him, even though you're not even for sure sure he exists. And he's calling you. He's like, just start talking to me. Just start praying to me and let's see where this goes. God's calling is always better than your plan. It's always better than my plan. That's the way this works. And that 13, 14, 15 year old girl, she understood this. So can you grasp what a 13 year old unwed virgin teenage girl was able to grasp 2000 years ago? Yeah, you can. His plans are better than our plans. His thoughts are higher than our thoughts. His ways are higher than our ways. So step into the call that he has for you because that interruption is probably actually just an invitation from God himself. And so here's my bottom line for you. When God invites you, say yes. Pretty simple, right? Whenever he invites you, whenever he says, here's what I'm calling you to do, you just say yes. Because listen, listen, understanding can come later obedience happens now. Understanding can wait. Obedience cannot. We step in and we say, God, I'm not for sure what this call is all about. I'm not for sure where you are actually leading me, but I'm going to trust that your ways are better than my ways. Your thoughts are higher than mine, that your plan is better than mine. And so I am going to step in and I'm going to say yes to the invitation that you have put in my life. It feels like it's an interruption right now, God but I'm gonna say yes to it. God, I'm gonna say yes to your call on my life because I know that your call is better than my plan. Whenever he invites you, say yes. Because his plan is always better. Because one of the great things about the Christmas story is that little baby Jesus doesn't stay little baby Jesus. Little baby Jesus grows up to be a man. And he is a rabbi, he's going around teaching, he's saying all kinds of incredible things teaching people to love their neighbor, teaching them that God is out there, that he loves them, that he likes them, that he wants a relationship with them. And he goes so far to show us just how desperately God loves us that he was willing to give up his life on a cross for us. And he willingly gave up his life. He took our spot. He died in our place. He took the punishment for our sins so that we could be forgiven of our sins, so that we could escape hell, that we could have eternal life with him forever. He did all those things. And now he stands and he invites. And it may feel like it's an interruption right now for him to be inviting you into a relationship with himself. 
You're like, I ain't got time for that. It's Christmas time. I don't have time to make a decision to follow Jesus. It's like, well, actually, actually, this may be the best time ever to say yes to the invitation that Jesus gives to you. So if you're watching online and you're like, you know what, I have never said yes. I know that he has been calling me. I know and I want to believe he has a plan for my life. I wanna invite you to step into that. So if you're watching online, I wanna invite you to the website on the screen below me to fill that, uh, go there, fill out that short little form and we'll be in touch with you real soon to talk about your next steps, about how to follow Jesus. But maybe you're here in the room and, and maybe today is the day to where you know that the Lord is calling you to step out and to step into relationship with him. Maybe the Lord is calling you to step back into relationship with him because you grew up in this area and so everybody grew up a Christian and then you went to high school or then you went to college and things just got a little wonky and you're like, it's time for me to step back into relationship with him. Well, if so, then today say yes to his invitation. And what's gonna happen is I'm gonna pray over all of us and then the service is gonna be over and I'm gonna come down here and stand right here. And maybe the call that God has for you today is to take 12 steps forward and to come right here and say, you know, Adam, I'm, I'm ready to give my life to Jesus. What must I do? And I'll be more than happy to talk with you and pray with you today. But his interruption is an invitation to follow him today. So Jesus, that's our heart today. We want to hear your voice. We want to hear your call. We want to trust that your ways are higher than our ways. Your thoughts are higher than ours. And we want to live and walk in obedience with you. So God, for those who today are maybe wrestling with this idea of following you, um, whether they're online, whether they're here in the room, I pray God that your spirit would just, that it would interrupt them right now. Wherever they are, whether they're sitting, whether they're watching, that you would interrupt them and say, hey, I'm calling you. Hear my voice. Come to me. And that they would have the courage, just like this 13-year-old girl did, to say, Lord, whatever your will is, let it be. And we pray that all in the name of Jesus. Amen.